When the pH is 7, then it's a case where the sample is neither acids nor base. But less than 7, it's an acid, we say. More than 7, it's a base all the way. What would happen if you had a party and you had that party in two rooms? So here are your two rooms. Each of these blue dots are your people. At the moment, you have five people in this room and five people in the other room. What happened if you had an increase in the number of people? So you have maybe four more people enter this room. What would happen over time? Well, over time, it might be possible that a couple of these people would go to the other side. And the reason why they might go up to the other side is to space out. You know, have a bit more space, it might be too cramped in the other place. So then you have you had nine here and five here because of those increases. Now you had two people go over and you have seven on each side. And the reason why I mention that is because we can actually use that as an example when it comes to equilibriums. Because what happens if we have an increase in substrate concentration is very similar to what happens if we have an increase in people. So this is about substrate concentration. What you have here is your equilibrium. Remember these two arrows mean your equilibrium. And what we're going to have to do first is we're going to have A and B, so A and B reacting to produce C and D. This is our reaction. At the moment we have four A's, four B's, two C's, and two D's. This is our actual equilibrium, and it's important to realize that the action numbers don't have to be constant. I mean, they have to be constant. The but they don't have to be the equal. So in this case, we've got more ABs than CDs, but overall, that number stays in the equilibrium. That ratio stays the same. So you're always going to have more ABs than CDs if we're in equilibrium. But what happened if, for example, we increased our Bs? So we added some more Bs into it. Let's say we had two more Bs. So now the chances of those Bs colliding with some of the actual As has increased because there's more Bs around. So these red dots will be more likely to collide with those blue dots, which are the A's. And what that means is once they actually collide, we have a reaction happen. That's a reaction is when they collide. So what that means, once they've collided, is you want to see a decrease in A and B because these two will be gone. And in the place of those will be the actual products, which are your C's and D's, which are the ones right here. So once they've actually collided, you're going to have them turning from the original A's and B's into your C's and D's, because that's the actual reactants right here. And what that means, if we increase, for example, if we increase concentration from the left side, that means we've disturbed the equilibrium. It's not the ratio it's meant to be. But that means it's going to be moving, to, shifting to the right, and we're going to have more products being released. So if we increase our concentration on the left-hand side, we're going to have a shift of the concentration to the right, so we're going to have more of the right. And that generally happens. Same thing if we, had, if we increase our Cs and Ds, if we increase these, what would happen is they would eventually have increased, but as soon as that happens, they start bumping into each other. And that means these will go down, and these will go up, because the reaction has happened. Yeah. Now this was the idea of substrate concentration, but if we go to temperature, something similar happens. So the example of temperature I gave is boiling water. If, for example, we want to keep our boiling water at 90 degrees Celsius, we can do it two ways. If it goes too high, let's say it goes to 95 degrees Celsius, what we could do is we could use that light, we could switch that actual fire a bit off, so make it a bit weaker. And by making it weaker, We'll bring it back down to original 90. So if it's gone too high and we make the fire weaker, it will go back down to our original 90. Whereas let's say if it's at 80, so it's not powerful enough, the temperature of the actual water. What we could do is we could boost our actual flame and bring our temperature back up to what it should be. So this way we can keep a constant temperature. And that's also an equilibrium is both temperature, pressure, and substrate concentration are important. So let's say, for example, in this example of a chemical reaction, we want to have a constant temperature, a room temperature about 25 degrees Celsius. So that's what we want to keep as part of our equilibrium. But let's say, for whatever reason, the temperature has gone up to 50 degrees Celsius. What could we do to bring it back down? So how could we bring it back down? Well, in this reaction, we have A and B colliding. And when they collide, they produce C and D. And this actual reaction is exothermic, or uh, endothermic, this is an endothermic. And what endothermic means is it absorbs energy, so it absorbs energy. So in this case, if we have added more heat to, to the actual 
and equilibrium to the actual reaction, we want to bring that heat down, we can just make more CNDs because if we make more CNDs, they will absorb that actual heat. So we've added more heat, we want to re reduce that heat, and this reaction, if we go ahead from AB to CD, that will reduce the heat by absorbing heat itself. So in this case, if we want, if it's gone too high, we would have A and B colliding more often, and that would reduce the amount of A and B because they have collided, and would increase the amounts of C and D because that's the product. And the reason why, why that happens is because that reduces the temperature back to normal. So now the temperature is going to go back to 25 degrees Celsius, eventually. Right? So let's say an example of an endothermic reaction. If the opposite were true, if it were too low, then obviously this wouldn't go ahead because it would make it even lower if C and Ds are produced. But it would actually go the reverse reaction. If it's too low, and we want to bring it back to 25, we would produce, we would have C and Ds colliding to produce more A and Bs. And that would be the reverse, so that would release energy. And the last thing we need to talk about, we still need to talk about pressure as well, because pressure is quite important as well. Now, what you can imagine, you might, you might imagine a classroom. And in this classroom, we have students in this classroom. And here we have this, the actual seating. So all of these gray chairs, gray things, or not gray, but brown, are meant to be your seating, so your seats. And at the moment, we have this kind of arrangement because we have a certain amount of space. But let's say we increase the amount of space, so we have more space for our students. But what would happen? We have more space in our class, which means our students can rearrange their actual seats in a different way. That means we have students being further apart. So now, because we have more space, the actual students just arrange the seats to adjust to that more space. And that's kind of normal expectation to have more space. And we have now we have single file chairs. But what would happen if we did the opposite? So if, for example, we we reduced the amount of space. So Let's say we shrunk the classroom. What would happen if we shrunk the classroom it would be more or less the opposite. We would have we would have less space. I'm going to remove some space here. We would have less space, which means that the actual class has to come together to be able to cope with that less space. So now the arrangement is like this, they're all together, come together, because they have less space and they still have the same amount of chairs. And this can be used to kind of simplify the idea of pressure. Of pressure, let's say we have this here, this is normally the way it is, we've got A and B, and that they was bumped together to produce C, and at the moment this is the type of equilibrium we have. But let's say we increase the amount of space, so we have this area which we add to the previous areas. So this would be the area we add to the previous areas. So now obviously we have more space. And because we want to fill in that space, what would happen is, well, A and B, that's two molecules. C is just one molecule. So if we want to have more space, we would have C decomposing into A and B. And that means we have more molecules. So then we would have Cs, these ones here, being removed. Because if they get removed, we have more A. So I'm removing three C's, and that allows us to produce three A's and three B's. Right? So C's, three C's are gone. That means three A's and three B's are added. That's just the way these equilibriums work, these chemical reactions. And now you can see we have more space, and we could use our space to split up more. And we did that by going to the reaction which produces more molecules. If we have less space, the opposite would happen. If we had less space, we would have more of those A and B's colliding to produce C's because the C's take up less space. But in this example, we had more space, so we had more A B's being produced. These are the ideas. We want to know about equilibriums in terms of reversible reactions, what substrate concentration increased us to the reaction, what temperature changed us to reaction, and what pressure changed us to reaction. These were just quick examples, but I'm going to go over real examples now, so I'll do that now. The actual dot point itself says identify factors which can affect the equilibrium in a reversible reaction. So you need to identify the factors, and these factors were temperature, concentration, and pressure. And quickly, I'm going to go over a couple of examples of each of those. So, for example, in this reaction, you have lead and chlorine ions, which are colorless in solution, reacting to form white precipitate called lead dichloride. And usually in equilibrium, you would have maybe this kind of scenario. At 25 degrees Celsius, you have 
a certain amount of the ion, a certain amount of the white precipitate, and you have a couple of these white precipitates swimming around in solution. Now, this actual reaction is exothermic, which means it releases energy. So it releases heat as it goes. So if you go this way, we have a release of heat. Now let's assume we have this at 25 degrees Celsius, but now we get some ice cubes. And we put these ice cubes into or next to the beaker. What will happen is the temperature itself will drop from 25 degrees, it will drop something too low. What can we do to bring it back up, the temperature inside, to maintain at 25 degrees Celsius? Well, this reaction actually releases heat. What we could do is we could move some of the actual colorless ions to form white precipitates, which means overall you're going to have an increase in heat being released through this exothermic reaction, and you're going to have more of these white precipitates being formed as a result. So you're going to have more of these being formed as a result. This was if we have too low, but let's say we did the opposite. We have another beaker. Again, initially it has three of these white precipitates, but now we increase the heat. So it was 25 degrees originally, but now we've increased the heat, which means we actually go up. So it's not 25, it's something too high. It's too high. So what we could do is we could do the reverse reaction. In the forward reaction, it will release heat. In the reverse reaction, it will absorb heat. So if we remove some of those white precipitates to be formed into these colorless ions, so I'll do that now, I'll remove some of the actual white precipitates. And what that means is we have less white precipitate, more of the colorless ions, but that also absorbs heat, which means our heat will go back down so it's to that 25 degrees. So now everything is normal again. So that's how an example of how temperature, how the exothermic or endothermic reactions can help maintain a constant temperature. Now when it comes to concentration, here we have hydrated copper and chlorine ions and our reactants, and they are blue. And we have copper, the, 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 copper chlorine um, ions which are, and water, which is green, in our, in our actual products. And we got that by adding some sodium chloride, adding some copper sulfate, and adding some water. And this solution is initially is green, uh, sorry, it's blue. This is initial solution is blue. But what we do then is we add some sodium chloride. So first step is to add some sodium chloride. And sodium chloride is obviously chlorine ions, which means we increase the actual reactants. Remember, if we increase the reactants, what will happen is we'll have a push to the products, which means over time, we're going to have more products being produced. What does that do to the solution of the color? Well, the solution will change from blue to green because the products are green in color. So you can see that solution turning into green. But the next step is to actually increase levels of water. So now it's green, but now we add more water to it. And remember, water is in the actual products. We have this being increased. And over time, we're going to have these two colliding, and then we're going to have an increase in the actual reactants. We're going to have a shift because we've added water, we have a shift to the left-hand side. And because left-hand side is blue, the are actually blue in color, we're going to see it go from green, eventually back to blue as well. That's just an example of what we do, what happens if we change the concentration, if we mix around the concentrations, what happens to reactants and products. And the way we could see that, visualize it, is by changing colors. And the last one is pressure. And we mentioned pressure is the amount of space these molecules have. Let's assume this is a normal equilibrium where we have nitrogen oxide and nitrogen dioxide and dinitrogen tetraoxides. Here we have two molecules, so there's two of these, so usually it's either two molecules or they can join together to form one of these dinitrogen tetraoxides. And so either they're in twos or they're all together in one. Now this is normal, so normally you have you know, five of these nitrogen dioxides and three of these dinitrogen tetraoxides. But what happens if, for example, first we were to reduce the space. So we have less space available now because we've shrunk the space available. Well, now we've increased the pressure. And what that means, it's going to go for the actual space-saving version to equal it out again. And the space-saving version is, in this case, the dinitrogen tetraoxide. So you're going to see more of those blue ones shift to the, gray, the brown ones. You're going to see that happen. So here we had five blues and three browns. You're going to see some of the blue ones disappear. The reason why they disappear is because they start to form more brown ones, just to have that same spacing that we did beforehand. Because we have less space, we want to make sure we go for the space-saving version. All right. So this happened if we have less space. But let's say, okay, now we have more space. So it's the opposite that we have now. Now we have more space. 
But what will happen would be the reverse. In this case, we're going to go from, we're going to do the reverse reaction. We're going to go from dinitrogen oxide to nitrogen oxide. So we're going to see some of the brown ones disappearing. So here we had three brown ones. They're going to start disappearing. And they're going to help us produce more of the blue ones, which are the dinitrogen oxides. Because for every one brown, we get two blues. And what that means is that now that I have more space, we have spaced it out more. And we did that by creating a version which has more molecules. And this happens if we have less pressure. So what you should know for this dot point, you should be able to name the different factors, so temperature, concentration, and pressure. And what happens to maintain that equilibrium? If we change the pressure, if we change the concentration of one of the reactants or products, or if we change the temperature, what happens to reactions to maintain that equilibrium? I hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.